Who or who is Preston John? Nah, seriously, man. I mean, this is part seven of the investigation. I'm just going to throw it out there. Is Priest John King David? Based on the information of the timeline, all the years added, have they projected this timeline in, in our version of history, giving us some old history, which is new history? I mean, would they mess you up that bad? Would they jack you up that bad? Would they change times and laws? Is this the evidence of the changing of the times and the laws? Is this the evidence of the changing of the times and the laws? On the 12th century, there are no others. So what Tomeco does quite regularly is he will appeal to astronomical arguments to try to determine which is the principal one. And, and his, his conclusion, and however crazy it may sound, is extraordinarily well argued, is that the only legitimate history is the modern history from about 300 on, and most of that, by the way, um, is from 900 on. From 300 on, we've got like statuary documents and things like that. Yeah, most of the, he thinks most of the things that we think of as historical events really did happen, but the question is when and where, and maybe, of course, how many times. And he thinks, well, it didn't happen 10 times, it only happened once, and most of that stuff happened after 900. Happened after the 900s, happened after the 900s. All right. So, we're just trying to remember. We're just trying to get to the bottom of things. Man. <laughs> we got so much to talk about today. Again, man, this is uh, part seven of the investigation of your man and my man. Your homie and my homie. Press the jam. I, I mean, seriously. I mean, all right, so... Is he the actual King David? Is he just a projection of this? Is he a uh, a hijacked version of King David? You know, this Abyssinian ruler. Is Abyssinia a hijack? Is this mixed multitude a hijack? Or are they referring to you as a mixed multitude? As in the mixed multitude that made the exodus as a mixed multitude? Leaving out together, everyone choosing up. What is going on? Is this king, is this Preston John Priest King, you know, a, a full blooded Mongol? You know what I'm saying? We read how he's related, a full blooded uncle to this Khan, this Genghis Khan, and how he's also called Hong Kong. He's also referred to as the, uh, what, the Man, what do they call this man? Ah, here we go. They call him Preston John, Emperor of the Three Indias. The Preston John's Emperors of the Three Indias. So, are we talking about just a title of Preston John and these emperors, like the uh, King David Dynasty, perhaps? What's really going on in this Ethiopia, Abyssinia? And why are they calling Pres Prester John Rajat Hir Raja? Rajat Hir Raja. Chola the second. Of course, they always got that Christian empire thing, but we researched the Nestorian Christian, which only means referring to old wise man of counsel. Remember Nestor. We're going to get into Byzantine and all that stuff, man. I mean, you know, when you're looking for Preston John, you just got to have it all ready. When they say Nestorian, you got to know it means old king renowned for wise counsel. So let's think. Let's all collectively think about an old king that is renowned for his wisdom. Wise counsel, they say. Now they try to tie this in to the three wise men visiting this Christus, this Christ. 
or we can surf our own wave and tie this wisdom into a old king renowned for wise counsel. Ah, first person that pops into my mind is King Solomon. King Solomon is an old king renowned for wise counsel. All right, you know, let's go, let's go, let's go. Who is Prester John? Who is Priest John? In search for Prester John. Right. My original plan for this episode was to start talking about the travels of John Mandeville, written by John Mandeville. Maybe. We think. Probably not. Regardless, sneak peek for next episode. As I started looking more and more into Mandeville, I realized there was in fact another story here that I wanted to tell. It's a story that blends books, history, legend, myth, and just a little bit of exotic travel. Now, my name's Dan, you're watching Bookworm History, and today we're going in search of the kingdom of Prester John. Okay, we on your ass, Prester John. Now, it all started in 1145. Christians living in cities in the Holy Land were having a pretty rough time of it. Muslims were making significant gains and threatened to drive the Christians out altogether. On behalf of these beleaguered crusader cities, Bishop Hugh of Javala was sent to Rome to meet with Pope Eugenius III and argue for a new crusade to relieve the Holy Land. Now, the meeting took place on November 18, 1145, and we have a pretty good idea of what they said and did because the whole thing was recorded by German Bishop Otto of Friesing. As the original tale goes, per Otto, per Hugh, a distant king in the Orient was making his way to the Holy Land to relieve the pilgrims there and on the way had defeated massive Persian troops. However, the king was currently stuck on the other side of the Tigris River, which had swollen and was impassable. He had been there for several years, waiting to get across the river, and ultimately had decided to return home. The king's name was Presbyter John. Now, if that tale sounds a bit anticlimactic, you're absolutely right, it certainly is. The reason for the tale is unknown, but there are certain theories. Remember that Hugh was arguing for a new crusade, assuming that this was not the first time Europeans had heard of such a king, Hugh could have been arguing against his involvement. If such a king were going to come to the aid of the Holy Land, then there would be no need for Rome to send such troops. But, if the story went that the king had gotten stuck on the other side of the Tigris River and was unable to make it, Rome would need to gather troops for a new crusade. Hugh must have argued his case fairly well, because on December 1st, 1145, a new papal bull was issued to launch a new crusade. It failed miserably. The Holy Land might as well have been waiting for a mythical king to cross a river. Now, Otto's tale was the first written reference of a Prester John, or a Presbyter John. If Hugh was telling his story to the Pope to gather support for a new crusade, then it's entirely possible, in fact probable, that the tale had already been around. Hugh's story, as it's written down in Otto's book, is a blending of fact and fiction. Now, there were Christians in the Far East. They were of a sect known as Nestorians, and had supposedly descended spiritually from St. Thomas, yes, the doubting one, who, following the resurrection, according to uh, the apocryphal Acts of St. Thomas, made his way to India, where he set up a Christian practice. As for... Yeah, you see how they jump on their own hijack shit? So, see how they... <laughs> Listen to how he breaks down the lineage. Now, you're reading about all this Abyssinia, uh, you know, connection. I mean, and they go into, oh, he's descended spiritually from St. Thomas, not by blood or by birth. You're reading that everything is being suppressed about this myth, right? They're making him a myth. But somehow he keeps connecting back to Israel somehow. He keeps connecting back to this Israel so somehow. Look how he says Thomas, spiritually yes, connected. The doubting one. Who following the resurrection in the Far East, they were of a sect known as Nestorians, and had supposedly descended spiritually from Saint Thomas. Spiritually from Saint Thomas. How do you descend spiritually from Saint Thomas? Oh, he has to blink after he makes that statement. Now, I just want you to remember. I want to get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more of this. Okay, I closed the link to uh, the Lost Tribes and Promised Lands. Let's get a piece of this right quick. You know. 
And remember, this is all available for you. This is all for you. All this information that we're kicking, everything's right here on the site for you. You know, we do our best to categorize things and kind of put them, you know, in a nice, cool place. You can hear your vibe suites, your four, three, two. You go in your vibe suites. You know, what I'm saying you have all these great, you know, genres and whatever vibe you're in. All this is in four, three, two. It's the only uh, destination that I know of. <laughs> That has a, you know, uh, catered to, you know what I'm saying, music that you love, you know what I mean, your different variations, man, all these 4 through 2 playlists, so this is thousands and thousands of, you know, songs that we tune to 4 through 2 for you to enjoy. So let's get to it. Uh, oh yeah, man, so yeah, this drop library is for you, man, love to let us find the truth, love to Get into the room. Uh, love to everybody that sends their books and links. That we can Welcome just to swag you know, be in swag frequency as a fan. Three, two, and a drop. As a unit. A With the fan. Right quick, man. Lost tries and promised lands. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Strides and Promised Lands, Rudolph Sanders, man, we've been all up in it. I want to get to, uh, what was it, the very end of chapter, was it three that we were reading? Black Devils. <laughs> I can't wait to drop on that. Because I know there's something to it. the job. I don't want to get all the way to the end of chapter three. Ah, so much drop. All right. Let me try to stay focused. Gotta see some more stuff. But yeah, there's so much relating uh, Press the John to the Indies, you see three indies right here. Let me get it bigger. It's the small print. Sometimes you gotta dig in that small print, man. India and Ethiopia. This confused geography has ancients and honorable roots. The first verse of the book of Esther describes the realm of the Persian king Osiris. Osiris. Whose palace was also was at Susa, as extending from India even unto Ethiopia and Greek and Roman authors, there is a similar vagueness about the vast region taken in by terms like India and Ethiopia. The latter, even in its narrowest sense, compromising a much larger area, comprising a much larger area than present-day Ethiopia, and beginning just south of the first cataract of the now and about its relationship with better known Persia in the apoc apocryphal act of St. Thomas. So here's this spiritual connection to St. Thomas that preached John has, right? The apostle moves easily from Persia and India, starting roughly with the 5th century apocryphal writer, the pseudo Abdias, who described the exploits of 
apostles, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew in each of the three Indias. This later concept became a standard one in the Middle Ages. One of the three Indias faced Ethiopia, according to Pseudo Abdias. The second faced Persia, and the third occupied the ends of the earth. The third occupied the ends of the earth between the ocean and the realm of darkness. The third became especially fruitful for the ge geographical imagination, the realm of untold islands to which the plural term Indias etymologically one and the same as Indies came to rest for once and for all. Ah ha. Oh. Nah, I wasn't even looking for that, but that's beautiful. That is beautiful drop. We're gonna get some more on this river, this beyond this river, this river, this this river, this river of stone and sand. All these myths, right? But remember the third India. Alright. Became especially fruitful for the G. Uh, geographical imagination so where is it the realm of untold islands when you hear islands you better think of your islands and where you're at right now I'm talking to those here in the so-called West the Americas the Caribbeans Haiti love to Haiti man love to the brothers and sisters in Haiti man made a career to rock with all our family there, man, to, you know, get everybody at peace, man. But I know it's difficult, so love to everybody. Just send our love. Keep sending our love to everybody, all our family everywhere, man. The region of untold islands, in which the plural term Indias etymologically one and the same as Indies. So when you hear the Indies, think about these untold islands, the Indias, which is the third India. Of the three Indias. <laughs> In which Preston John is over here. Which is why they're saying that he had all these mystical things. And even his letter that we're going to get. Some of this letter that he supposedly wrote. This King David. In the 1100s. Talking about this river. This land of milk and honey. Come on. Serve the way. Don't be afraid. Let me skip a little down here. Definitely check out parts one through six, cause I'ma go, I'ma go fast, man. I'ma assume that you got some of that drop. So if you want more of that drop, go back and get it. Even in its simpler, simpler Helen, Helen, Hellenistic form, Hellenistic form, the noble Ethiopian had proved unable to withstand the change or challenge of a demonic black image. Demonic black image. Let's go back here. With this, the line of Presser John's Ethiopian ancestry fades away in the haze of Hellenistic imagery and romance. So his image faded in the Greek imagery, which means what? Iconoclasm. They whitewashed him out and they hijacked him as this Nestorian Christian. But then they say his roots are the actual bloodline of Israel. But let's keep going. Little more is to be seen of the noble Ethiopian until his revival in the 12th century. All right. Remember we had that letter. That letter. Where's my letter? Man, I got so much stuff up for y'all right now. All right. Remember we had the letter. 1165, right? Okay, so 
With this, the line of Prester John's early Ethiopian or Abyssinian ancestry fades away in the haze of Hellenistic imagery and romance. Little more is to be seen of the noble Ethiopian until his revival in the 12th century, but except for the addition of medieval Jewish and Christian elements providing new dimensions of exaltation. So a lot of what we're getting with this Christian hijack today when we research Preston John and why that cat right now keeps bringing in all this Christian hijack and he's a spiritual descendant of Thomas. These are the medieval Jewish and Christian elements providing new dimension and exaltation. His essential outlines were to be barely altered from antiquity. The palette portrayed portraits uh, painted by Heliodorus and pseudo Kalanestinis Thines were a long way from the handsome black warriors of Herodotus. All right, so the paint, <laughs> the latter paint portraits painted by Heliodorus, the Hellenistic portraits, were a long way from the handsome black warriors of Herodotus, but they were perhaps the best they could be expected from an age in which color probably was becoming a serious problem. So that's where the whitewashing began with this Heliodorus portrait of Preston John. These Hellenistic romancers <laughs> preserve the idea of the noble Ethiopian against an advancing wave of color prejudice. Color prejudice by emphasizing every one of his traits but blackness. The result was a view of him that was to be revived in the era of Prester John. He was black, to be sure, but somehow his color was invisible. As in the Catalan Atlas, his features were off the edge of the map of the Christian consciousness. So also was his Jewish ancestry invisible. Jewish ancestry. We're just talking about him being black, so we're not talking about a Jewish person, we're talking about an Israelite ancestry. Buried deep in legend. It became legendary mythology, foundational legend of a Israelite black man. Perhaps we're just surfing away. I don't know. It's only part seven. I told you this might be a 22 part series, but you see how we doing it. We're pacing it out. We're taking our time. We're not getting overwhelmed. But man, is this exciting. Preston John was a symbol of racial and religious toleration. They had to tolerate his blackness within Christianity's complex heritage. Complex. But ultimately, he would not be able to withstand the assault of the new outburst of prejudice directed against both the eastern and southern components of his identity. Even in his Hellenistic form, the noble Ethiopian had proved unable to withstand the challenge of a demonic black image coming up from further south. They were demonizing his black image. So much the more vulnerable then with the complex figures of Preston John's B in the era of Christian fanaticism. So even after the Greek Hellenistic period, the Christian fanaticism against the Jew or Israelite came together with a loathing for the ways of black captives. Negas, slaves, captives of these Americas, these copper colored captives. So the Christian fanaticism against the Jew came together with a loathing for the waves of the black captives. So they hated these captives that began rolling off from Portuguese ships that had gone searching for Prester John in the first place. So they say they're going to find somebody to help them, you know what I'm saying, in their crusades and all this kind of stuff who's, who was known for his wars against the Muslims. And the Christians wanted his help, but clearly he wasn't messing with the Christian or the Muslim. So what was he and who was he if he wasn't really, truly down with their fundamental Christianity, which is why they keep labeling him Nestorian, which only means old king renowned for wise counsel. 
So if he's a Nestorian Christian, then he's a Christian of an ancestry of an old king renowned for wise counsel. That's all I'm trying to say. But now they're afraid of this demonic black image. All right. So just remember that. <laughs> all right. Y'all go check out the library, man. We're going to keep building it up for you. All this is here on the site for free. All these you can download for free. So love it. Support it. Dig on it. All right. And back to your regularly scheduled program in search for Prester John. I'm going to get a little more into it. Jump into it. Let's go. I don't really know, but it seems to be an interesting coincidence. The story would spread over Europe for the next few years and become increasingly popular, but ultimately people regarded it as clever fiction. At least until 1165, when Prester John himself wrote a letter. Uh oh. The letter was written from Prester John to Emperor Manuel Comenus of the Byzantine Empire and stated that Prester John was lord and ruler of the three Indias, near, middle, and far. He says that he is ruler of a land so vast that 72 kings pay tribute to him, and it overflows with gold, jewels, spices, milk, and honey, that there is in fact a river of stones that flows like water, and an ocean of sand that is unpassable except for four days a year. I told y'all we're gonna get on this river of stone, but y'all just keep hearing this river of stone. And it's the Sabbath river. It only rests on the Sabbath. Very interesting. Pay tribute to him. And it overflows with gold, jewels, spices, milk, and honey. That there is in fact a river of stones that flows like water. And an ocean of sand that is unpassable except for four days a year. Allowing people to pass to the shrine of St. Thomas at a mountain beyond it. It's a veritable paradise. In fact, bordering on paradise. Supposedly the eastern border of Prester John's kingdom is the Garden of Eden itself. Now, the letter was supposedly written in Arabic, translated to Greek, translated to Latin, and from there translated into just about every European language. However, to actually read the content of the letter, and looking at the earliest drafts we have, it seems that it was just originally written in Latin. What this goes to suggest is that it was not a correspondence from a distant king in India, but rather a clever fabrication from a monk in the Western world. Who actually wrote it? We may never know. Why did they write it? We may never know. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the story of Prester John, but why the Prester Listen John... Listen up. When y'all hear monk, when you hear monk, just, just, just put monk to the side. These are code words, and now we can decipher them. Monk. Remember monk. ...sent of the letter, and looking at the earliest drafts we have, it seems that it was just originally written in Latin. What this goes to suggest is that it was not a correspondence from a distant king in India, but rather a clever fabrication from a monk in the Western world. Who actually wrote it? We may never know. Why did they write it? We may never know. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the story of Prester. A fabrication from a monk in the Western world? Man. Well, you know, I'm surfed away. So we just got to go there. I was going to wait for this, y'all. Because we're only talking about Cahokia. We're only talking about Monk's Mound. Why is it called Monk's Mound? And why is this monk now being referenced to Prester John? And what is a monk? I don't normally go into my own drops. But in this case, I'm really going to teach me to be Priestley's drop. Yeah, you know I mean, so let's get this right quick. Let's go to about the 110 mark and just uh, listen to what a monk really is.
dictionary search encyclopedia monk. This is what they have. Derived from Latin, not not just, and from the Greek, whatever. Pay attention. Solitary, which is in turn is derived from the word, you know, whatever that is, from the, uh, designating a person who lives sequestered from the company and conversation of the rest of the world. <laughs> So they call they hide this shit, man. So they call it a monk's mound, which you look up. You have to look it up. You have to look it up, man. Solitary, designating a person who lives sequestered, separate from the company and conversation of the rest of the world. Separate from the static, from the boom. <laughs> All right, Katie questions. Love to teach me to be priestly, man. I hope you guys enjoyed that two-part series. And the brothers is going to continue, man, doing great things in his research. You already know it, man. So, all right. So, we know Monk. You know, we're hearing Monk. And remember, you know, we're just talking about monks. You know? You know? This is terrific drop, man. We're going to get in it. I'm just giving you a little preview. <laughs> yeah, man. We got to go there. When we speak monks, when we speak Preston Johns, when we speak Aryan, we're going to have to go all the way there. And know what this indie is all about. Know what these monks are all about. The legend of Prester John, a wealthy Christian king, right? An historian king, priest king, with the kingdom somewhere outside of Western European realm. Outside the Western European realm pervaded European thought throughout the Middle Ages, the limited understanding of unexplored regions of the world and the inability to find this kingdom. They couldn't find it. They had to come find you, resulting in shifting versions of the legend. Over the course of the Middle Ages, European believed his kingdom existed in the Far East, India, and then in Africa. But they still haven't found it. <laughs> so now they know it's not in Africa. And yeah, you know, we're going to get down into some more of this monk drop. And again, it always comes back to King Solomon, King David. No matter what link we come up, man, they keep linking him back and back and back and back. So let's get back to uh, you know, this monk business now that you know. It just means that you decided to do, be separated, separate from the static. That is a monk. But rather, a clever fabrication from a monk in the Western world. A Who actually wrote it? In the Western world. We may never know. Why did they write it? We may never know. Okay, so if they'll never know, and if they don't know who wrote it, then how do they know Prester John didn't write it? <laughs> Come on. If they don't know who Prester John is, and that Prester John might be King David, and if they're saying this is a letter from Prester John, aka King David, in 1165, huh? Letter of King David, 1865. King of Abyssinia. What are we talking about here, people? All right. Now we're going to talk about this Assyria. We're going to talk about this Abyssinia. We're just getting babies out until we put them all together. What are we really talking about? Let's go. There's a lot of unanswered questions in the story of Prester John, but why the Prester John letter was written is interesting. It could have been as a morale boost to Europeans who were still smarting from their losses in the Holy Land. It could have been a clever fabrication, just literature. It could have just been written as a hoax. 
Regardless of the who, the how, the why, or any other question you could pose, the Prester John letter spread like wildfire. Translated into every language in Europe, and every time it was, it would become more and more elaborate. Now, learned men perhaps knew that it was a fabrication. The letter didn't follow the form that regal correspondence was supposed to in those days. However, the public ate it up. We fast forward to the early 13th century, when word reaches Europe that there's a powerful monarch conquering all of Asia, and in fact attempting to conquer all of the known world. He is defeated by... Now notice how they say that they knew it was a fabrication because the letter did not fit the regal correspondence of that time. So what, it was out of format from their version of regal correspondence? Were they getting their version of regal from you? So because it was not in format of regal correspondence, they know it's fake. Again, if they don't know who wrote it, how do they know Preston John didn't write it or King David didn't write it? You can't say, oh, we have no clue who wrote this, but he didn't write it for show. You know what I'm saying? I got no clue, you know what I'm saying, who stole my uh cd player <laughs> but uh he did it for show and he didn't do it for show but i got no clue who did it at all no evidence you see the forked tongue they speak in their english you see the twisted nature of this speech we have no clue who you negroes are if they can't tell us who we are how can they tell us who we're not drop nation Europe, and every time it was, it would become more and more elaborate. Now, learned men perhaps knew that it was a fabrication. The letter didn't follow the form that regal correspondence was supposed to in those days. However, the public ate it up. We fast forward to the early 13th century, when word reaches Europe that there's a powerful monarch conquering all of Asia, and in fact attempting to conquer all of the known world. He has defeated Muslim and Persian troops, and is slowly making his way to the West. Could this be, they wonder? Could this be the Prester John of myth that legend has told us will come to the aid of the Holy Land and free the Christians from the Muslim rule? As if that wasn't enough, word reaches Europe that this king wishes to accept emissaries from Western nations. All of Europe was suddenly in a tizzy. They sent emissaries east as fast as they could. They wanted to form an alliance with this king, sweeping through the Holy Land and making the entire world safe for Christendom. The ruler's name, of course, was Genghis Khan. And not only was he not a Christian, but he had absolutely no interest in forming an alliance with Western nations. The reason that he wanted emissaries sent to him was to submit, not to form an alliance. Over the next 300 years, travelers in the East would slowly realize that Genghis Khan was not, in fact, the Prester John of legend of which they'd been told. Rather than being Prester John, he was, in fact, the conqueror of Prester John. So Prester John must be somewhere else in Asia. But as people would travel more and more, the edges of the map would slowly fill in and they would realize that Prester John was not there. But the story had deep roots, and people were convinced of the existence of this distant Christian king. When the letter from Prester John was first written in 1165, it said that he ruled over all three Indias, near, middle, and far. And at the turn of the 13th century, people in Europe really only had a fuzzy idea of exactly where India was. As people would discover more and more about Asia and finally come to the realization that Prester John wasn't there, they did not abandon the story. Rather, they just assumed they had been looking on the wrong continent. In 1497, Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama had set out, sailing from Portugal south, then east, then north, and then east again. He would return to Portugal in 1499, having discovered a sea route to India far more profitable and quick than the land routes they had previously been working with. As the Portuguese Empire became more and more powerful, they began to colonize more and more of the Indian coast. The only problem was the Red Sea, an area they could never quite seem to subjugate. Through repeated attempts at conquering the area around the Red Sea, they reached out to locals, trying to recruit powerful monarchs to their cause. They came to discover that in Ethiopia, there was, in fact, a powerful Christian king. He was wealthy, he ruled over vast territories of land, and he was a Christian. All of this seemed to suggest that they had finally, at long last, found the Prester John of legend. The fact that it was 300 years after the first letter had been written was no never mind to them. Two stories then evolved out of this. Either the Ethiopian king was the descendant of Prester John, and Prester John was merely a title that was passed down from generation to generation, or, 
as was written in one translation of the letter of Prester John, this Ethiopian king was the original article, the real deal, having simply drunk from the fountain of youth and become immortal. The Ethiopians were more than welcoming to the Portuguese. They also wanted an alliance to suppress some rebels that they were having. So, either Prester John is just a title, and we are talking about this particular dynasty of these Abyssinians, Ethiopian, you know, this Menelik, Solomon, uh, Solomonic, you know, Davidic, David dynasty. Um, you know, now either it's being hijacked over there and a hijacked version is going on, or, you know, that is a legitimate version. You know what I'm saying? We're all trying to see what's going on, but what we do know. Is that we're the last tribe to wake up. And it seems like a lot of people had to drop on us, man. A lot of people are impersonating us, man. So we're just trying to get to the root of it all. Kings to my bro. One more minute. Having trouble with in the southwest corner of the country. They also wanted to open up trade relations. The Portuguese kept referring to the Ethiopian monarch as Prester John. Completely unable to let the story go. The Ethiopians, still wanting to trade and form an alliance with the Portuguese, simply let it slide, although secretly they had absolutely no idea why they kept calling their king Prester John. The age of exploration would wear on, and ultimately even Ethiopia and Africa would become mapped. Finally, Europeans had to let the tale of Prester John go, realizing that he wasn't out there and probably had never been. Though the tale was romantic and perhaps spurred the common man to go and explore and seek new lands, the tale became relegated to the land of myth and the realm of Prester John would join other mythical realms, such as Atlantis, El Dorado, or Avalon. <laughs> so now, this myth is so great. This myth is so great that it's being compared to Atlantis. You know, and which, <laughs> at the end of this myth, it's just, you know, nothing but brick walls for these people. At the end of this, it's just, you know, we have no idea. We're just going to let it go. Anything that they allow just to get buried like this only means it's about you. You know what I'm saying? Anytime they allow themselves just to say, all right, well, it's just a myth forever. It has to, it has to deal with you. Because anything to do with them is front page news. Anything to do with them, even if they got to make it up, it's front page news. Anything they can't figure out is always, always, always about you. And you remember in chapter 10 when they were discussing the end of Prester John and they just, you know, got to the end of their trail. Just like this guy just kicked. You know, we got to the end of our trail and uh, that's the end of it. What does it say here? He, too, was a living symbol of the demystification. Let's get it bigger. He, too, was a living symbol of the demystification of the East, ending like the legend of Prester John in the Abyssinian dust. Just like old boy just kicked. Oh, this legend's going to go into the Ethiopian, the Abyssinian dust. The dust of the mixed multitude. With the legend, with that legend went for the time being. Listen up, man. This is about Preston John. I wouldn't be wasting my time. The only reason I'm paying attention to this because something I know is huge about this understanding, overstanding of Preston John, Priest John, the timeline, all that. Now listen, with that legend, this legend, for the time being, all hope of a noble image of the Negro. So with that legend went for the time being, all hope of a noble image of the Negro to counter the one that was coming with growing force out of West Africa. Body bag for the illusion. And by illusion, I mean the growing force, this new image coming out of Africa. So we had a different image, a noble image, a Negro image that was linked to this foundational legend 
of this so-called priest John, this so-called King David, perhaps. And when they lost on purpose all the trail into the Abyssinian dust with that legend of this so-called priest John, this priest king, for the time being when all hope of a noble image of the Negro? Why? What was happening to the noble image, the king image of the Negro, the negus, the king? What? what? What did they have to counter? What horrible thing was happening to the noble image of the Negro to counter that one the one that was coming with growing force out of West Africa. So a new image was spreading out of West Africa, a growing force. One of the most vivid depictions of the West African image now taking shape in the minds of many Portuguese can be found in the Esmeralda de Cito or Beast a geographical and historical handbook of the African coast written in 1508 by Duarte Pacheco Pierre, from which we have already quoted with reference to Master Jacomi of Majorca. Pacheco had worked for, for years as a civil servant in various parts of the growing Portuguese empire and had an intimate experience of the African slave trade and all this ugliness. The result is this apparent somewhat sensitive man is a bitterness turn not against the exploiters from amongst his own people as might have been the case in the latter era but against the abject African participants participants in the trade so his hatred was, was towards the African participants in the trade you know these people they knew that they weren't selling their sleep their their tribes members they were selling a certain other dark people a certain other tribe a tribe that was still asleep and don't even know they're indigenous to america for a poor horse you can receive here six or seven slaves he writes typically of one place of on the coast and with equal contempt for those who hand in human beings for horses and those who are thus handed in goes on to warn that the captain who is engaged in this barter should guard against these Negroes for they are bad people. <laughs> the loathing, the loathing that permeates, permeates his descriptions begins gradually to extend to physical characteristics, some of which are wholly imaginary as he describes them for example the inhabitants of this region have the faces and teeth of dogs and tails like dogs they are black and shunned conversation not liking to see other men so this is how you know this was the image all right that they, that they were bringing in <laughs> out of that that world to this world this was just the image of the negro that was now being put on TV. I mean, look on TV now. You're pretty much going to get, you know, some some type of brute characteristic, you know, some type of face and teeth of dog, some some type of image, some type of mean image. Papacheco Pacheco only rarely indulges in such departures into medievalism. From sound it, it contemptuous observation, if contemptuous observation, and when he refers elsewhere to a great multitude of new peoples and black men and black men in Africa, whose color and shape and way of life none who had not seen them could believe. Whoa. Refers elsewhere to a great multitude of new peoples and black men in Africa. So this is a quote. A great multitude of new people from where? Here. I told you they took your ass from here, Negro. 
and put you in Africa, Negro. A great multitude of new peoples and black men in Africa, new peoples and black men in Africa, whose color and shape and way of life none who had not seen them could believe. <laughs> All right. So he's, he's, he's talking shit, but he's also kind of putting drop in there. And the drop really is that the color and shape of you, <laughs> even they're going to try and make you look like a beast, almost beast in human form and all this kind of stuff. Just know that you had a, a characteristic that was uncommon to the dark people in Africa because you are new people and that's the drop. He's just saying that these are a different dark people that we found over here and they're new peoples and black men in Africa and they have a color and shape and way of life. No one who had not seen them could believe in all this other shit. So, you know, it's talking shit. Yeah, you know I mean, but uh, let's get it, man. Let's go ahead and dig on it. And remember, man, this timeline plays. So these folks that are dropping about this timeline. It plays. It plays in the way from your surf, surf in the way. It plays in the way. All right. Now, what's interesting in this eleven sixty five letter is that over here. I mean, all this is interesting because it's all happening in the twelfth century. And it just seems like this is the shit that has been, you know, covered up and turned into mythology, man. So they're calling him a wealthy Christian king, but you know he wasn't Christian or Muslim. But, you know, this is the origin of their Coptic situation. As it got hijacked, you know what I mean? So we're trying to see what's going on with a kingdom somewhere outside the Western realm. So we got that. All right, so let's just get it from here. The prospect of a Christian king seemed realistic enough that in the 12th century, Pope Alexander III sent a message by envoy to the fabled king. So Pope Alexander III sent a message to this king, the same king that wrote that letter. All right. Same king that wrote the letter. Okay, so letter of King David, 1165. So we're talking about the same exact year. In 1165, a letter sent to several European capitals from an Ethiopian ruler. Here we go. All right, so... The 12th century, Pope Alexander III sent a message by envoy to the fable king. The messenger, however, never returned. So, whatever happened to him, he didn't he, he, he didn't return. That's kind of how you know that this guy wasn't messing with these guys like that. He wasn't messing with this version of what you're thinking like that. He wasn't down with them. He wasn't down with the Muslims, the Arabs. <laughs> So in 1165, a letter sent to seven, several European capitals from an Ethiopian ruler fueled the legend. This legend, this letter reportedly became known as a letter from Prester John. This letter established a concrete connection between Prester John and Africa or Abyssinia. But even as we're reading and researching, that even wasn't concrete. They never found him. You just heard the guy say that they never found the guy. He became just a myth, right? So how can they get a concrete connection if it's just mythology still? You see how you got a Barry Sanders, he's fucking hijacked. In the 15th century, legend resurfaced as Italian and Portuguese explorer became more interested in natural resources of uh, Africa. Portuguese explorers traveled down to East Africa and searched for Christian kingdoms of Prester John. So now we have the 14th century, the uh, you know invasion going on, right? All the Muslims and Saracens being kicked out of Spain. All the Jews being expelled from over there. You know what I'm saying? 
in Columbus over here the same year, 1492. So we're just talking about the 15th century. And now they're just looking for Prester John, but they're really just invading people. How can they be looking for Prester John and invading people at the same time? But they need help against the Muslims. With the conversion of these states, the Portuguese, the Portuguese hope to establish control over the region to meet their commercial and military goals. So they just wanted the military alliance, the allies of this fabled king. But they never got it. By in the by the late 15th century, Portuguese explorers did make contact with a, a Christian king in Ethiopia. So they're just claiming like, all right, maybe this is him. And wrote descriptions of the court, the state, and its people. These descriptions and their correspondence provide historical Bible insight into the Ethiopian kingdom of the time. <clears throat> the uh, Portuguese viewed the wealth of Ethiopia as the source of gold for King Solomon's temple. Here we go. I told you this Preston John situation keeps going back to King Solomon, back to King David. Let's keep going. Conflating the legend with the biblical story of King Solomon. The emperor of Ethiopia at the time, Zara Yaqua. Notably wrote European rulers expressing his incredulity, incredulity and dislike of the title king and the attribution to Prester John. <laughs> so he said, I got nothing to do with this guy. What are you talking about? The legend of Prester John in Africa and particularly Ethiopia became one of the reasons of earlier uh, European ex explorations of the African coast. So again, they're saying, oh, that's the reason. Nah, they were looking for gold and things. They had the Papa Bull, 1452. It didn't even mention Preston John. Ah. Didn't necessarily mention Preston John. You know. Necessarily. But remember. He's the last noble image of the Negro. The last noble image of the Negro. And all you got to do is hit that dumb diverses. If you know what's good for you. So you know what's written about you. And what they said and what they wanted to do to take you out. We grant you kings of Spain and Portugal by these present documents. This is from the Pope Nicholas V. 1452. Papal Bull. This is your invasion record. This lets you know you're a prisoner of war. We grant you kings of Spain and Portugal by these present documents with their apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens. Don't make me go there again. These are just dark people and pagans. We call them heathen. They call us pagans, right? We, <laughs> we call them heathen. And any other unbeliever unbelievers and enemies of Christ Christians black Christians this is why you're Christian this is how the cross has got here they put out a pipe of bull to invade everybody who are enemies of Christ according to them all these indigenous people who never even heard of this hijack because they were connected to the creator only and now someone severed that connection Wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, their duchies, their counties, their kingdoms. Ah, kingdoms. Hmm. Kingdoms. Eh? Kingdoms. Letter of King David, 1165. Kingdoms. Kingdoms, kingdoms, kingdoms. Remember, always remember one thing. We're only talking about Preston John. The Christian king, the historian, the wise king, the wise council king. We're only talking about Preston John.
We grant you kings of Spain and Portugal by these present documents with our apostolic authority, full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate the Saracens and pagans, all dark people, and all other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, wherever they may be, as well as their kingdoms, duchies, counties, principalities, and all other property. Take everything and reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Perpetual. That means forever, Negroes. Serve me forever. Reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. Take their kingdoms. Take their kings. <laughs> take their kingdoms. Take their kings. So let's get into this letter of King David. What do you say, man? What the brother say, man? What the brother kick, man? What they say, he say. Is this it? Alright, I think this is it. So, you know, dodge the hijack. They're going to put that Christ in it. Remember how that, you know, the drop was kicking. How they keep Christianizing everything, right? But I, John priest by the almighty power of God and the might of this hijack here hijack now focus king of kings and lord of lords to his friend Emmanuel prince of Constant Constantinople greeting wishing him health prosperity and the continuance of divine favor our majesty has been informed that you hold our excellency in love and in that the report of our greatness has reached you moreover we have heard through our treasure, treasurer that you have been pleased to see send to us some objects of art and interest that our exaltedness might be gratified thereby being human. I have received it in good part, and we have ordered our treasurer to send you some of our articles in return. Should you desire to learn the greatness and excellency of our exaltedness and of the land subject to our scepture, then hear and believe. I, Presbyter Johannes, Johannes, the Lord of Lords, okay. surpass all under heaven in virtue, in riches, and in power. Is this King David? That's all we ask. You know, maybe not. 72 kings pay tribute, pay us tribute. Is this King David? I just want to know, is this King David? All right. In these three Indies, we just, you know, the Indies, the islands, the islands, you, in the three Indies, our magnificence rules, and our lands extend beyond India. Keep India in mind. We arrest the body of the holy apostle Thomas Judas, the twin. It reaches towards the sunrise over the waste and it treads toward deserted Babylon near the Tower of Babel. Don't forget my Babel, my tree. Don't forget Devil's Tower. 72 provinces of which only a few are Christian serve us. Each has its own king but all are tributary to us. Our land is home of elephants, dromedaries, camels, crocodiles, metacolanarum, melacolanarum, camatinus, man, whatever this stuff is, man. White and red lions, white bears, white merlots, crickets, and griffins, tigers, hyenas, wild horses, oxen, wild men, men with horns, one-eyed men. Is this talking about? The biblical Canaan here. Are we in the land of Canaan? So called Canaan. Because he wouldn't leave. Men with eyes before and behind. Centaurs. Fawns. Sat satyrs. Pygmy. Four eyed. High giants. Cyclopses. Giants. And similar women, 
It is the home too of the Phoenix and all nearly and of all nearly and of nearly all living animals. Man, I'm just looking at this man eaters. We have some people subject to us who feed on the flesh of men, who feed on the flesh of men and of prematurely born animals and who never fear death. When any of these people die, their friends and relations and, and relations eat him ravish, ravenously, for they regard it as a main duty to much human flesh. Their names are Gog, Magog, and all these other joints right here. I mean, are we talking about the biblical canon? I'm just asking you to dig on it. Pardon me while I fix my battery so we can have a little more hang time between you and me. You dig. Alright, so I wanted to get some of that. Definitely check this letter out. Uh, uh, you know, our land. Here's where he's talking about the land. Alright. Our land streams with honey and is overflowing with milk. In one region grows no poisonous herd, nor does a querulous frog ever quack in it. No scorpion exists, nor does the serpent glide amongst the grass. Not, not can any poisonous animal exist in it or injure anyone. What land is that? Among the heathen flows... Through a certain province, the river Indus, encircling paradise, it spreads its arm in manifold windings through the entire province. Here are found the emeralds, sapphires, carbuncles, topazes, uh, crosslights, onyxes, beryls, sardius, and other costly stones. Here grows the plant Acidos which, when worn by anyone, protects him from the evil spirit. Did you know about that? Forcing it to state its business and name, consequently the foul spirit keeps out of the way there. In a certain land subject to us, all kinds of pepper is gathered and is in exchange for corn and bread, leather and cloth. I mean, you know what I mean? So, you know, they were talking about seas. In a territory is a certain waterless sea. Okay. <laughs> All right, so, you know, Priest John slash, you know, King David perhaps slash hijack Ethiopian, Coptic, Abyssinian, you know, who knows? Who knows? Is he a hijack or has he been hijacked? It's all we've been asking. We're investigating. You hear me sometimes saying he's a hijack. And other times I'm like, is he an Israelite king? Is he King David? So I'm just surfing the wave, man. Rock with me. All right, help me out. I'm trying to figure this out, man. My head hurt. All right, but my heart is warm. All right, check it out. In our ter territory is a certain waterless sea consisting of tumbling billows of sand never at rest. None have crossed it. None have crossed the sea. It lacks water altogether, yet fish of various kinds are cast up upon the beach, very tasty, and the like are nowhere else to be seen. So this waterless river flowing with sand and stuff has fresh fish that is bomb when you taste it. Three days' journey from this sea are mountains from which rolls down a stony, waterless river. Here we go again with this waterless river, which opens into the sandy sea. As soon as the stream reaches the sea, its stones vanish in it and are never seen again. What? What, nigga? 
Y'all hear this shit? <laughs> so, look, man, when, when this waterless river, which opens into the sandy sea, as soon as the stream reaches the sea, its stones vanish in it and are never seen again. As long as the river is in motion, it cannot be crossed. Only four days a week it, is it possible to traverse it. Between the sandy sea and the said mountains in a certain place is a fountain of singular virtue which purges Christians and would-be Christians from all transgression. Or, okay, without the hijack in it, you know, can it be a hijack-free fountain which purges the hijack? The water stands four inches high in a hollowed stone shaped like mussel shell Two saintly old men watched by it and asked the comers whether they are Christians or are they about to become Christians. I mean, damn, people. Goodness gracious. All right, man, I'm just, in, I got encircled by hijacks right there. Anyway. Um, yeah, man. So, you know, we just talking about Preston John, man. And it just goes on and on and on. It's more drive. Every time I look at it, I see some more drive. Beyond the Stone River are the ten tribes of Israel, which, though subject to our own kings, are for all that tributary to our majesty. In one of our lands are worms. Well, back it up. So, does this mean that these Israelites are tributary to this priest John or does it mean that the ten tribes are tributary to this priest John King David I guess if you look at it in terms of him being King David if we dare if we dare search surf the wave based on this timeline situation right here I mean you got us here to believe it who, by the way, says he was the first witness of this. Well, Fermenko did. He said, let's make no presuppositions about this. Where are the exact astronomical solutions for this triad of eclipses? And they turn out, there turns out to be one in the 11th century A.D. and one in the 12th century A.D. and no others. So what Fermenko does quite regularly is he will appeal to astronomical arguments to try to determine which is the principal one, and, and his, his conclusion, and however crazy it may sound, is extraordinarily well argued, <clears throat> is that the only legitimate history is the modern history from about 300 on, and most of that, by the way, um, is from 900 on. From 300 on, we've got like statuary documents and things like that. Most of the, he thinks most of the things that we think of as historical events really did happen, but the question is when and where, and maybe, of course, how many times, and he thinks, well, it didn't happen 10 times, it only happened once, and most of that stuff happened after 900. Yeah. So most of it happened after the 900s, people, can you dig on that? And we're still going to get into the quest for Pastor John, Andrew Blake Denton, and Athens State University. Is it play play? Are we playing around about our investigation? Love to drop nation and everybody sitting this uh, great work in, man. Oh, man, oh, man. Oh, man, oh, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me back my letter. Give me back my letter. So he's saying, beyond the Stone River are the ten tribes of Israel, which, though subject to our kings, are for all that tributary to our majesty. If we're talking King David here, then he's saying, you know, he's the king of, you know, what? He's the king of Judah. So is he speaking as the king of Judah? That these other tribes are tributary to Judah. Is that what he means? Or is he just a hijack, hijacking Israelites? These are all good questions. Right? These are all good things to serve. Alright, uh, we keep hearing about this river, and I keep wanting to uh just get back to a little drop about this river, man. Sambanya River. Let's just read it. You research it, pull it up. San Batnyan River, also San Batnyan, 
Sabaya, a legendary river, which part of a legend, <laughs> a legendary river across which part of the ten tribes were exiled by the Assyrian king. Okay. So this river is very important. It's a legendary river, just like your legendary priest king. Across which part of the ten tribes were exiled by the Assyrian king. So they were exiled across it. Part of the ten tribes were exiled across this river. This waterless river. Let's go. Shalamanassar. Or are we talking about Cham? Remember the timelines. They're giving us 7 something BC. Flip that to after the 900s. And then you run into Cham. Remember Cham, you know, according to uh, another doctor we read, wrote up on Prester John, they said in 1203. They said 1203 was a takedown by Genghis Khan or Genghis Cham on his uh, foster father, they said. Oh, Hong Kong. So this river, which parts the ten tribes, which part of the ten tribes were exiled across by the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser, or Cham, right, and which rested on the Sabbath. So this river rests on the Sabbath, right? The river is mentioned in the Targum, Pseudo Jonathan, uh, Exodus 34.10. I will take them from there. So in Exodus 34, 10, look it up. I will take them from there and place them on the other side of the Sabbatian River. The rabbis declared that the ten tribes were exiled three times. Once beyond the Sabbatian River, once to Daphne, or, or Daphne of Antioch, and once when the divine cloud descended upon them and covered them. The first ascription of miraculous qualities to the river is found in the Talmud when Tinius Rufus asked R. Akiva how he could prove that the Sabbath was divinely ordained as the day of rest. And he replied, let the river Samanyam prove it. It was unnavigable on weekdays because it flowed with strong currents, carrying along stones with tremendous force but it rested on the Sabbath. These passages give no indication as to the supposed location of the river or the origin of its name. All right. Let me skip down a little bit because we got some of this uh, in a previous drop. All right, let's go right here. All right, so he... So we're talking about Pliny the Elder. Pliny, Pliny, Pliny. Keep hearing my Pliny. Uh, describe the river at, in, its, in his natural, nat natural uh, history. And his observations agree with the rabbinic resources. He also claimed that the river ran rapidly for six days in a week and rested on the Sabbath. This characteristic of the Sabbath prevented the ten tribes from leaving their place of exile since they could not cross the river during the six days of the week. And though it rested on the seventh day, the restrictions on travel on the Sabbath rendered the crossing equally impossible. So that's why they, it was restricted for them to travel on the Sabbath, and therefore they couldn't cross it on the one day that this river rested. Josephus, however, described the, the peri, uh, peri, periodicity, periodicity, golly, uh, Man, my eyes are getting tired. <laughs> the periodicity of this river in a different location, claiming that it was uh, quiescent, quiescent on weekdays and flowed only on the Sabbath. So then they flipped it. So Josephus uh, described, described the periodicity of this. Uh, he flipped it instead of it going. Uh, running six days a week and resting on the Sabbath, he flipped it so that it flowed only on the Sabbath and rested for the rest of the week. So that's how they, of course, hijacked this river. Uh, skipping down, it says, And it has always been observed to keep strictly 
to this order, whence they have called it Sabbatical River, so naming it after the sacred seventh day of the Jews. Right. According to this, this description, there is no explanation for the inability of the ten tribes to cross the Sabbatical River during the weekdays. So this thing is all over the place. So let's go into a little story with the Moses. All right. The children of Moses are surrounded by a river resembling a fortress which contains no water but rather rolls sand and stone with great force. If it encountered a mountain of iron, it could be it could undoubtedly grind it into powder. On Friday at sunset a cloud surrounds the river so that no man is able to cross it. At the close of the Sabbath, the river resumes its normal torrent of stones and sands. And apparently they've got some good fish too. The general width of the river is 200 L's, whatever that is. But it's certain in certain places it is, it is only 60 L's. Why? So that we may talk to them. But neither of us can cross to the other side. So certain places of the river, it's it's not so wide that they can actually talk to the some you know the for, the uh, you know children on the other side. So those ten tribes that were on the other side of the river can still communicate in certain parts of the river, but they just couldn't cross it, and they couldn't even you know travel on the Sabbath. So they were separated by this enormous river <laughs> resembling a fortress it says uh, the children of Moses are surrounded by a river resembling a fortress because it contains these stones and sand is this play play we're just talking about the Sabbath river alright so you know you can dig some more on it but you know it's something going on with this river it's something going on and uh you know, when we're talking about Preston John, it seems to always come back here. Now, I thought we were going to have time to get into this, but uh, we'll get into this Aryan situation. We'll get into, you know, this Khan and this Cham and this India situation and how India plays, the Hindu America situation. I got all kinds of links. Uh, Hindu America. And we're going to get into this and how, you know, they describe, you know, originating a lot of, you know, some of the, you know, history here. You know what I mean? So, you know, I don't want to start now because I'll get, I'll get too deep too fast. But if I might, just kind of dibble dabble, man, back into uh, a little bit of this quest for Preston John and then we'll, you know, make a dismount. Uh, somewhere else. I don't even know, man. Cause, oh, man. You know, I got so much information. <laughs> even in this part, like, I thought I can get all this in in one take, but even this is a three part series alone, you know. So, this is only part seven. You know, we're going to just dig on Preston John and just keep digging in as we go. Um, but let's get it from, I want to get right into it. The question that begs to be asked is when and where did Preston John come from and by whom? Like the legend itself, there are few certainties about the true origin of Preston John. Alright, so just because, just like, just like you, Negro, isn't that, can you see the, the rhythm? Can you see the pattern? Whenever something's uncertain, it always has to do with you. They make you an uncertainty. And again, if they can't tell you who you are, how can they tell you who you're not? How can they tell you that Preston John is linked to Africa if there's, if, 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 if nothing is certain around him? How can they say he's not this? And how can he say he is this? Like the legend itself, there are few certainties about the true origin of Preston John. Just like you, Negro. My copper color people over here. However, what is known is that the first written account about Preston John occurred in the Chronicle Historia de Duabus <laughs> Sivia Tubus by Otto. So here's this Otto again, the Bishop of Frisi. 
In this account, Otto refers to the Presta as Presbyter Jihadis. In the account, Presta John defeats an army of the Medes. Pay attention to these names, the Medes and Persians before his failed attempt to reach Jerusalem. Otto heard this tale from the Bishop Hugh of Jabula. Bishop Hugh of Jabula. Though it has been suggested that Bishop Hugh created the tale, it is more reasonable to believe that the tale had been told orally long before Otto heard, heard it from Bishop Hugh in 1145, 12th century. Since the 19th century, historians have made the connection between Bishop Hugh's tale of the, of the Presper's victory over the Persians with an actual historical battle with the emperor of <laughs> Karakite. Karakite defeated the Seljuk Turk ruler Sanjar of Persia, Persia 1141. Remember this Kite. It is thought that the legend of Prester John was interrelated to the legend of the Shrine of St. Thomas among the Nestorian church, wise council, wise men, community in India. So we keep coming back to India. Uh, we're going to get into India in May. Living in India, Prester John was assumed to be adherent to Nestorian Christianity, which the Vatican considered heretical so they called them heretics so the vatican wasn't rocking with these nestorian christians hmm however india was significant to medieval christians because they believed that after pentecost the apostle thomas was sent there and preached the gospel converting and baptizing the hindus into christians okay so there was a hijack going on there the apostle died and was enshrined by the followers of the faith he had preached unto while the peaked while this piqued his interest of some what happened next took Europe by storm. The mysterious letter appeared in Europe to Emperor Emmanuel. The author of this letter introduced himself as Preston John of the Indies, greatest king of the Christians. What follows in the letter of Preston John can best be described as utopian fantasy. In the letter, the author claims to have 60, 60 kings at his vassals and possesses the strongest castles in the world, numbering 72. All right, so we just got into some of this. We're talking about the three Indies, India Major, Middle India, India Minor. But remember, India is also referring to these islands. These islands at the ends of the earth. Now, we just brought up something very significant about this Nestorian business, about this Kite. And I said, remember Kite, man, because <clears throat> Kite kind of plays a little bit. Kite kind of plays a little bit. There is a comic, a Marvel freaking comic, Eric, Son of Thunder. Can you hear me? Can you dig it? Y'all look this up, Eric, Son of Thunder. Look up episode or little version, whatever, uh, volume, whatever, 24. DC Comics, Marvel Comics. Now, this particular issue right here, Twixt, Gog, and Magog. Twixt, Gog, and Magog. So, this Gog and Magog popped up with Preston John in his letter. About the man eaters. Remember, he mentions the man eaters? Gog and Magog. Do we have to get it? Uh, remember Tataria? Remember Cham? We're only talking about Tataria. Uh huh. Man eaters. Gog Magog. Their names are Gog Magog. Alright, so now we got this comic. Now here's the synopsis. Here's the characters. Eric, Valda, Satricas, Johannes, which is John, Prester John, Angelica, Haikon. Alright. The curse of Gog and Magog is unleashed upon 
al Braqa. So we got to see what that is. But while everyone was expecting two moldering armies to emerge, they ended up with two enormous monsters made up the bones of the ancient warriors. Fire, a fire proves useful in bringing them down, so they had to destroy these enormous things with fire. Though, in other news, Brunello and Satira rescue Valda from the... All right, all right, so. Oh, yeah, let's keep it going. Uh, so these guys rescue Valda from the ravishment of Hakan uh, in Arak. I right, remember the giants of Arak. Arak. Resist the temptations of Angelica. I mean, teach me to be priestly, man, and putting it down for a minute. Remember his other drop with Eric and the Giants. Finally, when all the dust has settled, Johannes, priest John, <laughs> permits all the strangers to, to leave the city. So this John's in control, and he permits all the strangers to leave the city before he returns Albraca. Albraca to its rightful place outside of time. What is that? In a later era, he will be known, become known as Prester John. And this is in the DC Marvel comic book. You know they hide stuff in comic book. So he returns Albrica. So I said, where the hell is Albrica? Albrica. Albrica, also spelled Abrica. Albrica. Is a major city of Cathay. Cathay. I said, wait, Cathay? Ah, Tartary? Tartary? Tartaria? Cham? Tartaria? Albrica. So we're still back here. You see how we keep reading brought back? And this is an earlier map of it. Where we're only talking about Presbytery Johannes, Prester John. Let's keep going. So I said, all right, what is Cathay? Let's get into Cathay. Tartary. <laughs> now, Cathay is saying alternate name for China. Ah. So this takes you into China. It originates from the word Catan. I said, remember the Catan. When we refer to Catan. Living in India, Kara Kita, K H I T I A, Kita, Kita. All right. So now we got Kitan, K H I T A N, Kitan. China, Kitan, Kitan people, also known as Kite, Kitai, K H I T A I. I believe we have a match for Kite. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you, we get to the bottom of things. I'm trying to tell you, we get to the bottom of things. So, this Prester John was known for having victory over the Persians with an actual historical battle where the Emperor of Kara Kite defeated the Seljuk Turk. So, this was an actual historical battle that they confirmed that this Kite, Kara Kite, defeated this Turk. So Presser John was on the Kitay side, defeating the Turk, the Kitay, Kitay. And these are the original Asiatics as you get down to the Jin dynasties. All right, so look, man, we're just surfing the wave. We're just flowing here, man. Don't let it offend you. We still got to get into the land of Presser John. Love to Uno on the beats, man, for this amazing PDF that we will get into, man. And we will get into man the land of Preston John. Can't wait to dig in. I mean, obviously, I'm just getting into a lot of this great drive that you see that we have to get to. But this is not play play. Elaine, Sam Q, Sam Cole, 
the land of Preston John. We are coming to you. Let's just make our dismount, man. You know, we're gonna get more into this letter, more into these man eaters, more into Preston John. Remember, we're just talking King David. We're just talking Preston John. We're just talking timeline. Don't be offended. We'll get more into this uh, river as well. And, uh, yeah, man, if we had to make a dismount, I mean, how would you do it? Would you go all the way back home? I mean, would you take it all the way back home? Uh, love to Brother Sanchez. Bro Sanchez, man, kicking that Tesla drive, man. Let's just get some of this energy, energetic, and make an energetic dismount. For a you know what I'm saying? I want to jump right into it, man. I'm Welcome it back. Me. Peace and love to you all. Yeah, love, brother. Each let's, radio signals and his attempts it, to notify the government the way, and military baby. concerning what Suit he had up. learned, but his letters apparently went unanswered. Tesla spoke in confidence to several of his benefactors. In man, let's bring it back. All times. We live in a world, unfortunately, that feel the need to prove that presence, so we come up with the testing of the... said this before he died, and he felt this way before he died. You have to do your research and understand the deception. Whenever you hear extraterrestrial, that's a red flag. It's like a virus on a computer. When the red sign come up, you can go in. It may not be deception, but it's a high chance that it is, okay? I do believe in other beings, but I don't believe in outer space. I believe in inner space, and I go into that in a lot of previous videos. But to stay on subject here with Tesla and the alien deception, the deceivers will accredit all of Tesla's work to aliens. As I explained previously, instead of telling us the truth that Tesla didn't receive any communications from aliens, they always want to make it like there's this one divine man who received the message from some hidden deity. In a lot of cases, they use aliens. But really, Tesla knew what the ancients knew, that energy was all around you. And because of that, Tesla would go on to prove the existence of the ether. And the ether is just another word for the ever-present energy that is omnipresent at all times. We live in a world, unfortunately, that feel the need to prove that presence, so we come up with the testing of the ether, and Tesla proved that there is a supreme intelligence at the root of our reality, whereas the modern scientists wanted to exclude a deity from science like we have today in this modern... So Tesla, with this energy situation, actually proved the supreme creator, the supreme intellect of the universe. Prove the actual vibration of the actual intelligence of this energy, of this consciousness that we are in. You can't be conscious if you don't know whose consciousness you're in. And Tesla proved energy, frequency, vibration, the secret of the intelligence and how to use it flow in the ether and truly surf the wave energetically and of course if you prove the creator you gotta go modern matrix and as we move on you will see more of this deception nikola tesla wrote about his years of research to interpret the strange radio signals and his attempts to notify the government and military concerning what he had learned but his letters apparently went unanswered Tesla spoke in confidence to several of his benefactors, including Colonel John Astor, who owned the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. These benefactors listened to Tesla and secretly funded what was to be the start of mankind's first battle to regain control of its own destiny. So why do I say that there is an alien agenda deception surrounding Nikola Tesla and the plagiarization of his inventions? Tesla was an awesome man. He was a genius. Even though he rediscovered this ancient technology, it was during a modern time that was so far ahead of his time, the fact that he would re-stumble upon this ancient science that many of us are tying into modern metaphysics and all of that today. And we're interpreting this ether 
this ever-present energy, this intelligence in so many ways, but it's all hidden in the world religions and heliocentrism, and Tesla knew that. You will know that as we move on and get into Tesla and flat earth. You see, why is it deception to accredit Tesla's great mind to a message from aliens? Because it takes away the fact that he was an awesome man. If you tell me that everything he gave the world come from aliens, then they should get the credit and not Tesla. So again, it's a form of plagiarization. So what I'm about to read to you now is a quote from Nikola Tesla, and this is the quote that a lot of deceivers use today to support the idea that Tesla got all of his knowledge from aliens. And I read, my brain is only a receiver in the universe. There is a core from which we obtain knowledge, strength, and inspiration. I have not penetrated into the secrets of this core, but I know it exists. That first line was taken by deceivers to say that Tesla received his information from aliens. The fact that Tesla said his brain is only a receiver channeling information that's already in your DNA, that's already there. He didn't say he channeled it from aliens. The deceiver said that, not Tesla. So again, speaking for dead men. So yes, Tesla had many documents to support that he was working on aircraft similar to that of the Hitler von Mana. And the fact that he had ties to Hitler and the Nazis shed more light on the Vermana Hitler conspiracy and show you where the little green men deception come into play. See, the little green men are who they use to hide the ancient truth all the time and to discredit the ancestors. Once we learn the ancient truth about the spiritual technology of the pyramids and the Tesla Tower and the mushroom mythology, once we realize these simple truths of nature and tap into this one divine energy source, we'll realize that paying for power is silly. The ancients would laugh. They tapped into the infinite power source that was omnipresent. Today we ignore it and they got us deceived into world religions and pseudoscience as opposed to real science. So people like Neil deGrasse Tyson drop mics. They are not real scientists. Real scientists do experiments. They don't tell you mythological stories with a bunch of animations. And I was deceived with that type of deception. But here's a new day today. And those with eyes will see. And those with ears will hear. So understand that if all of the credit was given to the ancestors, we would also begin to explore their beliefs and their cosmology and everything that made them great and we will become great today. So they intercept that greatness by telling you the ancestors or Tesla and all of these people get the information from aliens. Once we give the information to aliens, they keep us looking up into outer space and there's nothing in outer space. It's all inner space. There is no space. There's divine energy that's omnipresent. There's a divine supreme being that's omnipresent. There's energy all around you. So they have us looking up into the stars and we've been deceived thinking that we're looking into outer space. The stars are right above your head. Nothing is separated by light years and all of this foolishness that they give us. And as we move on, you will have no choice but to realize that Tesla was indeed a flat earther. And in fact, his technology he used is only possible on a flat earth where we can bounce signals over vast distances. And that signal will not be disturbed by any curvature. The cell tower technology is Tesla technology that rules our world today. They tell you they got satellites in outer space. But the only picture you ever saw of a satellite was a painting or a computer generated image. You never saw a real picture of one. Therefore, you believe in something that don't exist other than their matrix. The truth is everything wireless in our world today is achieved by Tesla's technology and ancient technology. These towers are divine and you will see them all in ancient art and they are misinterpreting the literature to this art and got you thinking the ancients were some dummies when really 
they are recreating their matrix with the ancient sciences and hiding them with aliens. So while you go to be deceived in their schools, Tesla knew the ancient truth. Understand that most scholars acknowledge that Tesla's obscurity is partially due to his eccentric ways and fantastic claims during the waning years of his life of communicating with other planets and death rays. So when they was killing this man slowly, everyone get old, but if you research you will understand he died of asphyxiation, and I will get into that in a minute, but he was clearly murdered, and uh, they had been working on it a while, the very people he was trusting was killing him. So they were speaking for him the whole while they were doing so. Because if they really spoke for the voice of Tesla today, everyone would have free energy. That is the vision of Tesla. But the vision of the aliens that they give you keeps their matrix going and their world of consumerism going where we are enslaved. So it is now known that many of these fantastic inventions of Tesla are scientifically accurate and workable. It has simply taken mankind this long to catch up to the astonishing ideas of a man who died in 1943.